Good morning on the 28th Sunday in Ordinary Time. We'll look at uh, Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 30. It begins with Jesus setting out on a journey, a reminder that the journey is towards Jerusalem, where Jesus will suffer, die, and rise from the dead. As in the Gospel of Mark, he already predicted twice, and coming soon will be the third prediction. And as he's journeying, an eager man, a man who is excited about Jesus, who is excited uh, with his teaching, runs up to him, kneels him down, does him homage, and asks this question. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So two issues with this question. First, uh, good teacher. Okay, so so often in the Gospel of Mark, we, we see people struggle to identify the true identity of Jesus. So a uh, good teacher, yes, but there's more to him than just a teacher. He's not like all the other teachers, and we're going to see that in his response, okay? Uh, as we proceed through this gospel passage, we're going to see how Jesus is radically different than teachers. And so the, the second component in good teachers, what must I do, Okay. So, good teacher, and what must I do to inherit eternal life? Two issues with that question there, okay? Good teacher, and what does he have to accomplish, okay? That's where we are we're often so wrong in, in our discipleship, uh, in uh, our journey in faith, is the emphasis is, is on what we must accomplish, Okay, and Jesus is going to correct both those notions. And so the first one, he says, well, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. So there's kind of like an, an implicit response there, um, and a little, not implicit, but more indirect response on Jesus, like, hey, you call me good, but the only one who's truly good is God. Okay, and uh, in a way, Jesus is saying, you know, really, it, God is the appropriate response, you know, to his title rather than just teacher. And then he goes in to the commandments. And notice these commandments that Jesus lists here. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear fault wish. You shall not defraud. And then the one different one, honor your father and your mother. Notice how the majority of the commandments are in the negative. And you got to think of it this way. Why did God bring you in, into existence? Why did God bring us into existence, include myself into that? It's not just to not do something wrong, right? That, that's, why, that's not why we exist, to just not do something wrong. He didn't create us so we don't kill or don't commit adultery or don't steal, <laughs> You know, but sometimes, you know, that's that's kind of how we, we, we base our lives and that's how we, we base ourselves in our stance to God. Well, I haven't done these things wrong, so I'm pretty good. Um, Christian discipleship is more of the affirmative. It's more it's more of doing something. OK, and Jesus is going to lay out what that doing is. And so the man says, well, hey, teacher, I observed all these from my youth, you know. I observed them all from my youth. And I think the most the majority of us can, can say we did a pretty good job with those things too, okay? Um, and yet the man is still kind of des dissatisfied. Remember, he's going up to Jesus, asking about eternal life. There's something longing within his heart that he wants. And deep down he knows that this life and his very meaning of his life and existence must be more than just not doing something, okay? So, so he's looking for this. And as we're going to see in Jesus' response, he's, he's going to kind of regret asking this question. And so Jesus, the only time in the Gospel of Mark, looks at him, loves him, okay? Look and love, especially that, that phrase, loves him. It's the only time we hear Jesus looking at someone with love. All right. He, he admires the man's eagerness. Okay. This, this isn't 
this isn't one of these confrontations, you know, that, that we've heard throughout the Gospel of Mark between, you know, Jesus and the Pharisees or the scribes. You know, this isn't a, a hostile, tense conversation. This is a person with sincerity, a person who, who wants to do well in life, and a person who wants to, to be with God. Uh, and Jesus recognizes this. But now here's, here's the kicker here. Go sell what you have and give to the poor. And then you will have treasure in heaven. And then follow me. So the way to inherit eternal life is to give up everything that you have and to follow him. A good teacher will not say that, right? This is, this is why the, the first part of, you know, good teacher of, you know, that's why it's problematic, okay? You would almost say like, you know, any teacher that would say that to give everything that you have and then follow him as the way to eternal life, no teacher can promise that. No de- teacher would dare to ever make a recommendation like that. You know, yeah, follow me for some guidance and, you know, some path maybe to joy and happiness. Yeah, but to eternal life, to give up everything that you have and follow him. The only one who can ever make a claim like that is God himself. You know, that's it. Another implicit, uh, indirect reference to his divinity. And notice that, you know, the, the commandments that Jesus lists, that's the Decalogue. That's, that's in the Old Testament. Jesus is adding something new to the commandments of God. Again, the only one who has authority to do anything like that is God himself. And that's what Jesus is doing here. So again, we go back to the, the question, either, you know, either Jesus is the son of God or he's a really bad person. Because again, a really bad person would tell you that, you know, the way to eternal life is to follow him. Like that, that's a, you know, that's just a, a terrible person. No one can deliver on a promise like that right? except God himself. And so the man walks away sad because he had many possessions. It's too hard for him, right? It's too hard for him. Uh, I think we can bank the case if we examine ourselves and what we tell ourselves in our lives, what we need to have, we would probably have the same reaction as that man too, right? A lot of things we tell ourselves we need to have. Um, And we spend a lot of time and energy on convincing ourselves, yeah, this, this is what I need. I absolutely need this, okay? Whatever it is, you know, whether it's our retirement accounts or whether it's, um, you know, our possessions, you know, to kids, to teenagers, it's their phones, right? You know, that they fall apart if they can't find their phone. You know, we, we there's a lot of things in our lives, myself included. Um, yeah, I got to have this. And the reality is, uh, I think as Bishop Barron said, I, I, lo- I love this quote he said, he says, you know, the things that we have, you know, hold on to them, give thanks to God for them, but have a light grip on them, right? Meaning that, like, be ready to let it go, <laughs> you know? Uh, and I think that's how we should kind of treat the possessions that we have. Uh, have them, but have them with a loose grip, you know, because, well, ultimately one day we will have to let it go, right? At the moment of our death, everything that we have, we're going to have to leave behind, but, but we'll have to let it go. And then... Jesus continues on to this statement, you know, how hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God, right? He's recognizing it, that this is a difficult task for, for us and for our fallen nature. Um, to go back to the, to the theme of the last three weeks, you know, that childlike dependence on God, where, you know, our Lord is calling us to what? To be children ready to serve their heavenly father. But then also on top of that, What do also children need? Children have this kind of absolute dependence on their parents and their parents providing for them. You know, like young kids, uh, you know, they, everything that they have, it comes from their parents and they they always have this trust that their parents will will come through for them, you know? Um, And that's, again, the type of mentality, type of attitude that our Lord is calling us to do, being ready to serve our heavenly father, but also to the that depend that he will provide everything that, that we need. 
you know, and then Jesus gives that famous analogy. Uh, you know, it's easier for a camel to pass through an eye of the needle than for one who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. You know, that exaggeration on the part of Jesus uh, that, that we hear often, especially in God, uh, Mark's gospel, that extreme exaggeration, just like we heard a couple of weeks ago. You know, if your left hand causes you to sin, cut it out. It's the same type of mentality our Lord's given us here. You know, it's easier for a camel to pass through an eye and a needle. But as he tells the disciples, here's the moment of hope for all of us. With God, all things are possible, you know. So again, going back to the initial question, the man's like, okay, what do I have to do? What do I have to accomplish? And really the answer is nothing. It's, it's God who's going to accomplish it for us. Um, and what he's asking, just like he looked at the man with love, what he's asking is for us to be ready to help, to serve our Heavenly Father, but to also depend that he's going to be the way in which we're going to earn eternal life, that it's not going to be just on our effort and our effort alone. And, and hopefully in one way, you know, it kind of gives us a little bit of solace and consolation. Um, you know, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves that we're not doing enough, we're not good enough. Um, but God is, God is powerful and God is all good God. Um, and he's here. He, he, he became incarnate for the very reason. Um, he's gone to Jerusalem for the very reason uh, that we can't do this ourselves. We can't obtain eternal life for ourselves. He has to give it to us. And the way that he gives it to us is to follow him, to remain in communion with him. May God bless you.